September 2020 talk at the Tavern. Uh, I'm Steve Jakobovic with the Historical Society of Carroll County. Uh, today, Steve Bowersox will be our guest speaker. Steve will speak about the students from Westminster High School that served during World War II. He's been able to place over 650 Westminster High School students, male and female, that served all over the world and in every major military campaign. I'll share some of their stories with us tonight. Uh, the Community Media Center, we've been working all year on the BLTs and talks to the tavern with them as well as our virtual gala. And they've been superb the entire time. So thank you so much to uh, the CMC team. And we also uh, thank the Nonprofit Center, particularly Mark Kreider, uh, for out allowing us to stream our Talk of the Tavern from their office tonight. Um, we've muted everyone's audio for the speaker's presentation, but just to make sure there are no disruptions, please turn off your microphone and video. And both toggles are found on the lower left corner of your Zoom screen. And for those of you who've been watching all along, I will skip the instructions on how to ask a question until later tonight. Um, but now it is my great pleasure to introduce Steve Bowersox. Uh, Steve is a Westminster native and has been a teacher at Westminster High School since 2002. Uh, he's also a high school graduate of Westminster High School. Steve earned his master's in education from Western Maryland College, now in Lacania, and he served in the US Army. So I'm happy to turn the presentation over to Steve to talk about Westminster High School's contribution to the greatest generation. Take it away, Steve. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, hello, everyone who's joining us tonight uh, for this virtual Tavern tour. <clears throat> uh, my name is Steve Bowersox. I teach at Westminster High School, like you were told. I graduated from Westminster High School, but I think this connection to Westminster High School, I need to go even deeper into, I think could it makes this whole thing make a little bit more sense. Um, my parents, met at Westminster High School. They both graduated in 1951 uh, and were married for 59 years before my mom passed uh, several years ago. Um, every single one of my father's siblings went to Westminster High School. Every single one of my mom's siblings went to Westminster High School. Their children all went to Westminster High School. Um, in my mother's family, her parents graduated from Westminster High School in the 20s and most of their siblings went to school also. My wife went to Westminster High School. My kids went to Westminster High School. It's, you could probably just say we don't move very much, but Westminster High School has played a big role in our family. Um, I've also, you know, loved history ever since I was a kid. And so when I came upon some information that highlighted Westminster High School in World War II, it was like the perfect combination um, for me. And so that's, I've been digging into this since, I don't know, 2007. I've done a couple of presentations at different places. Um, I, and it's an on again, off again, kind of love affair. I, I, I'm really into it for a few months and then I take a few months off, but um, it's a great story. I think it's very compelling. I wish I had a way to get it out to more people, um, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on how this even started and then we're going to talk about uh, the buildings that were Westminster High School uh, and some of the stories. Uh, as Steve mentioned uh, prior to this, I have come across information for over 650 students, 400 and some of them graduates from Westminster High School. So in this 35, 40 minute format that we have here, there's no way uh, I'm going to touch them all. So hopefully, if you tuned in hoping to hear your relative's name, and I'll say it, you don't get too mad at me, but hopefully at another time, we'll be able to get the information out. So I'm going to uh, share my screen here, show you some pictures, uh, talk about some things, and when we're all done, there will be a chance for you to ask questions if you would like to. Let's go with it like this. So these are the places 
where I have gathered most of my information. The Historical Society of Carroll County, and I'm not just giving them a plug because they're hosting this thing, they have a treasure trove of information over there that um, has been very, very helpful to me. Index cards that the soldiers filled out when they came home. Uh, it talked about where they served, even where they lived, uh, what they did, medals they had, all that kind of stuff. So that has been very, very helpful to me. <clears throat> Westminster High School. Um, I'll tell you how this started and we'll get into the Westminster High School thing. Um, I was looking through some books in my classroom. There was one called Ordinary Americans. And I looked this up so I know the page number. Well, on page 194, uh, there's a story about a woman and she happens to be from Westminster, Maryland. And you know, as a history teacher, you never find anything about your own town. So that was something I thought I would share with my students. And her name was Mary Spear. Mary Spear was living on Main Street at the time and the war was closing. Might have been BE Day, something like that. And the flags are fluttering. You can imagine what it must have looked like. Um, and a person walked up the street and she was not flying a flag. Her husband was serving in the military. Her son went off to serve. And this person said, you must not be very patriotic because you are not flying a flag. <clears throat> and she said to him, I had a flag. It's the flag that came home on my son's coffin, my only son, but I donated it to his school where he was the class president. So it took a little while, but the gears started clicking. And I was like, well, we were the only school in town at Westminster High School besides St. John's had a high school also. So I thought I'd go look. Um, in our archives at Westminster High School, which was a couple of cabinets in a file cabinet. And there was no flag there. But I did find in this room, which I guess I don't go to the library enough, uh, every single yearbook from 1921. And so I started looking through them. And we also had periodical magazines. Uh, and I found this young man, Hugh Spear, which I'll show you his picture in a couple of seconds. He was the class president of 1941. And so that kind of got me thinking. And then I found a periodical that listed every single person as of October of 1942, who was then serving in the military from Westminster High School. Um, I'll turn this off for a second, just so I can talk a little bit. Um, so that really kind of got me interested because you know I grew up here and if you grow up in your little town, you're like, this little town didn't have anything going on. Um, but this kind of opened the door for me. So I started out with 200 and some names and then I went from there using the yearbooks and then using that information also with um, the information from the historical society. Another piece that has just been hugely uh, important to me, I'm sorry this isn't as big as it should be here, Carroll County Times archives. If you haven't discovered the Carroll County Times archives yet, you don't know what you're missing. If you are local and you wanna find out some history, uh, you can find it at the Carroll County Public Library's homepage. It's archived back to 1920. Um, you can find all kinds of stuff. So I've been digging through the war years there to try to um, find other stuff. So that's where I've collected a lot of my information. So that young man, Right there is Hugh Spear. I'm getting some instructions here. It's okay. Sorry, folks. Technical difficulty. It's my. It's me. So. Which one? It says slide show. Yeah. Click on it. Still doing the same thing. Right. I hope it'll work out. It's okay. Sorry, everyone, for the interruption. Um, this young man is named Hugh Spear. Um, he graduated from Westminster High School in 1941, and he was the class president. Um, he's, it's a very young, it's his graduation picture. He may have been uh, 17. He only went to 11th grade at this point in time. 
His father was a professor at Western Maryland College. He also helped coach soccer at Westminster High School in the early 20s. But he was going to go to Western Maryland College, and then he's going to, when we needed a lot of people to fill in after D-Day, a lot of replacements were brought in, and he's going to be killed on March 26, 1945, uh, less than a month and a half before the war with Germany would be over. So it's just a sad story. And then find out that when he was in high school, he lived on Ridge Road, and it was the house right next to where I live now. So that kind of even brought it in a little bit more. So coming up next, I'm not sure how many, you know, I don't, don't know who the audience is out there. Uh, Westminster High School has been housed in three different buildings. All three of them are still standing in town or outside of town. This is the original Westminster High School. Um, the top floor is not on it anymore. From what I understand, there was some storm damage maybe. Um, but that is at the corner of East Green Street, and on the left-hand side is South Street, which is really an alley. And then you go down to um, Main Street with Center Street right in front. That's the original high school, built in 1899. Now, there are no playing fields here or anything like that. So after 30-some years of using this building, they thought they needed someplace else. So a new site was located and a new building was built, and that is this, which is now used as East Middle School here. It's on Longwell Avenue. This picture um, is taken prior to 1942 because the gym, which would be on the right-hand side of this building, is not there, and that's when the gym was built. And I include these pictures just for the historical purpose that I don't know if everybody really knows where these buildings are, but also because every person that this story is about went to one of these two buildings. And some of them went to both of them. Um, also, Westminster High School itself, this building right here, is the building where the students are going to be in during the war. This structure is a big building, has an auditorium uh, with a speaker system. So a lot of meetings during the war are going to be held here. So the building itself the kids came through it, and that's important, but this building is a kind of a mainstay for Westminster during the war. Red Cross meetings, auxiliary police meetings, all these different people were meeting at this place. Um, I think I have more instructions coming, but it's okay. We're going to roll with it. Did we get from current slide? That. From current slide. Yeah. Look yeah. at that, people. Look, we're back in action. Okay, so again, this is East Middle School. I'm not going to mess with this anymore. I'm just going to hit buttons. Um, this is, and it's interesting for me, this is where I went to middle school. I went to, I went to East Middle School, which was the high school. I went to elementary school at the other high school. And then I went to Westminster High School. So I was in all three of the buildings. So this is, uh, again, important for the town. It's a very historic value for the town. And now this building is kind of falling apart and is on the chopping block. And it sounds like in the next couple of years, they're going to replace it with another building on the site and kind of get rid of that, which to me, kind of sad. Um, okay, so that's the high school. Now, let's get into other parts of the story. So if you have ever seen, and if you're local, you may have seen some of the displays that we've done for honoring the graduates of Westminster High School. And mostly it has just been their graduation pictures. So they're kind of isolated and it's just their graduation picture by class. I thought for tonight's experiment, what we got going on here, um, it'd be fun to see these people as human beings. So these are pictures taken out of the old yearbooks where you get to see them mingling with their friends. And these pictures are fun just for the fashions and the hairstyles and everything else. Um, but here are a couple of graduates uh, that happened to be a part of the 1928 Al staff. So you'll see their names next to them, and then you'll see a, a number, and that's the year they graduated. And it's just fascinating. So Donia Nigren is one of the first people I kind of came across when looking through things that, that made me go, that's really cool. Uh, he graduates in 1929, and he's going to join the Navy. Uh, he's going to be in the Navy prior to World War II starting. 
and he is going to be stationed at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. He's a signalman. His wife lives there with him. He will be there when the Japanese attack. His quarters are totally destroyed. They lose everything. He stays at his duty station and does his job, and he will be the first Westminster person to kind of uh, get some notoriety for the war. He gets a presidential commendation from Franklin Roosevelt for staying at his station. He gets a pay raise, a raise in rank. Um, and then he will come home also and visit his family while he's there. They lived on Madison Street, right off of Green Street. I could be telling a story here, but I think his father was one of the first mailmen here in town also. It's an interesting name. Uh, this guy over here, John Whitmore, who it's right, uh, I hate to even mess with this, right here. John Whitmore, also in this group photo, he also is going to serve. He graduated in 1930. He will end up winning a silver star. He's wounded a couple times. Um, and Marshall Campbell is going to join the Navy. He's, he's got a brother also who joins the Navy. But I tried for class, I tried to use these pictures for class to say to kids who are in clubs or on teams or in the band or whatever, you know, you've got these people around you and sometimes you're friends with them and sometimes you're not, but they all have a story and they're all going to go places and you don't really know what's going to happen to these people in the future, if that makes any sense. Okay. Continuing on, this is the 1931 soccer team. Um, interesting, they have a soccer team. They don't have a field. So these guys had to borrow like um, farmer's fields to play in. Mr. Reef Snyder up here at the top is going to become a general during the war. Uh, w. Carter Stone, his dad was Dr. Stone, uh, and he lived at 121 East Green Street and the only reason I know that is that's because that's where I grew up. So it's something I remember. He's going to go off to West Point. He will win a silver star. He's going to be wounded a couple times. Lots of stories about him in the Carroll County Times, which makes me believe that his father was connected with the editor, but that I don't know for sure. The guy next to him is Lacey Phillips. Phillips graduates in 31. He will join the local National Guard that is, uh, serves out of the armory, Company H. He will go with them and be a part, if not of the D-Day invasion, like D-Day plus one or two. Um, that young man, unfortunately, is going to lose his life uh, in Europe, in Normandy, while we are trying to clear uh, the area and move on towards Germany. So again, just a bunch of guys on a team, uh, but these amazing stories that come out of, uh, that come out of it. Uh, these two gentlemen, they both graduate in 1933. Sterling Robertson is going to become a pilot in the Air Force, the Army Air Corps, and will fly, I think it's 67 missions that he flies. A lot of times, if you flew 25 missions, they let you come home. And then it got to be more and then more and then more. But he uh, was a very, I'd say, locally very famous anyway, and had such a great reputation that he was given the honor of flying, not, not the pilot, but the co-pilot of the lead plane during the D-Day invasion. That's how highly thought of he was with his unit that they gave him the honor of being in the lead plane. Pretty cool for Westminster, you know, kid who grew up out here in the sticks. Um, so I, these stories just, they keep coming and there's so many of them. Um, and I think, I don't know if any of you have seen um, Ken Burns documentary on World War II, The War, but he focused on poor towns. I think Westminster has enough stories that can rival some of those towns also, these great stories. This man over here to the right is Reese Starner. Um, he was my baseball coach when I played Babe Ruth baseball. He was kind enough to keep a job open for me at the Register of Wills when I went to the Army myself. He flew over 50 missions also as a tail gunner, you know, up in the air. I'm sure it was terrifying to be with these people up in the air 
you know, Germans all over the place. And both of them survived without a scratch. Uh, their planes got shot up a little bit, but they did not. So again, classmates, Robertson, Starner in the same homeroom, could be, not sure. I, I can't remember exactly how many people were in their class, probably knew each other. Um, and just, again, the small town producing these people who did pretty amazing things. All right, James Bowman. <clears throat> I should have brought the written script for this. Uh, take a look. James Bowman's a pretty average, ordinary looking person. You probably would not have picked him out of a lineup and said, that dude is going to do amazing things. But he does. So he graduates in 1935 from Westminster High School. In like a three month period, he's gonna get wounded three times and keeps coming back for more. And he's gonna be awarded the Silver Star and he gets it because he volunteers. Evidently at a crossroads, there was a building that the Americans held and the Germans wanted it really badly and they were coming in with tanks. And they needed someone to get a message down to headquarters that they were in trouble. Uh, so he volunteers for what is almost a suicide mission. And he runs across this open field and has to jump this like, I don't know, like 15 foot ditch. And he's got people shooting at him and they talk about how many and the, the terms they use are not uh, what we would use today, krauts, you know, was the term, killed eight people at one time going across there, ran down, delivered the message, came back through the fire again, doing all this stuff that you, they make up in movies and you don't believe could really ever happen. But this is James Bowman, class of 1935, again, Westminster High School kid who does things that you think other people would do. So award the Silver Star. Again, Silver Star is really difficult to win. Uh, we have six or seven people from Westminster High School that are going to win that award. Um, and it's just, you've got to be incredibly brave, maybe a little crazy, uh, to do some of the things that these guys were able to do. All right, so the next class, I'm not going to go through every single class at school. This is just a highlight of some of the things that I've uh, collected along the way. We have three M names from the class of 1936. So I believe they must have been in the same home room unless they got split up somewhere. So Frank Mather, Charlie Moss, and Donald Meyerly. These three guys are going to graduate from high school and go to separate ways, but they're all going to end up in the military during World War II, and they're all going to end up on the beach during D-Day. Frank Mather will be at Utah Beach with his unit. Charles Moss is going to land on Omaha Beach, the most famous of the beaches, uh, as, a, as a leader of a group. He's going to get wounded on the beach. And then there's Donald Meyerly. Meyerly um, is with a field artillery unit. Uh, he's a truck driver. At least he is on the day after D-Day. So D-Day stormed the beaches, cleared the area. A lot of supplies start coming in. Meyerly is driving an ammunition truck up on the bluff above the beach, and it gets hit by a German shell, and he's going to get blown up along with a bunch of other people that are close by. <clears throat> His grave, he's buried in the cemetery above Omaha Beach. Um, I was fortunate enough to get some correspondence with a younger brother of his years ago, and he sent me a letter that talked about what it was like to be home by himself when the knock came on the door to tell him that his brother was dead. So he's home, it's a Sunday, his parents are out doing something, he gets the message, and the, the person who delivers the message says, you might wanna hold on to this and not give it to your parents until tomorrow morning. So this young man had to sleep on that and then present the news to his parents the next day. He talks about how many visitors came on the morning, how his mom cried so much. Um, so the effect that these things have on the people back here uh, in town, they lived on Main Street also at this time. Okay, um, the play, school plays, we have school plays. 
place. This is a small play. There aren't as many people in it. Um, there are five guys in this play. Four of them I know were in the, the military. The guy farthest right, white jacket on, his name is Eddie Eckenrode. He was an aviator also. He wrote back uh, near the end of the war when there was mop up detail going on and the fighting had stopped, slowed down a little bit. His units walked through a concentration camp that had just been liberated and hadn't been cleaned up. So there were bodies stacked up all over the place. And he wrote back to the Carroll County Times describing what he had seen. So again, little Westminster guy, you know, put in a place that you think of other people from other places having to go through that and then kind of having to live with that memory also. So uh, Eddie Eckert, he lived on, I think, West Green Street this time. So the play 17. Don't want to forget the women. Uh, finding women that served is much more difficult than finding guys who served because women get married and they change their name and I don't know who they are. So we have a dozen or so that I've been able to find some information on. And again, they're gonna serve in the auxiliary units. This is the first time women are allowed to serve in the military besides being nurses, because we need so many guys that it's easier to bring a woman in. And I don't mean anything about this to do like secretarial kind of work, admin kind of work. Uh, and that guy that was doing that job can now be handed a rifle and go out and fight. So lots of women are gonna join. They brought in the recruiters into town uh, she is the first woman to serve in the waves, which was the auxiliary for the Navy. Uh, people are going to be serving here in the country. Others are going to, women are going to serve in Japan. They're going to go all over the place after the war is over also. So I thought I should have a picture of Miss Brony. This is an interesting situation. There's Sterling Beard. If you're around town, you might know Sterling um, or known of Sterling and Ralph Stefan. Um, this is them together in the Middle East. They did not, they weren't serving together. They just happened to run into each other in the Middle East. And there are so many stories of Westminster guys who know each other just happening to bump into each other in places like Japan or in the Pacific, uh, there's a story of Charlie Zincon uh, and one of the Hurwitz brothers. There was four Hurwitz brothers. Their dad owned a jewelry store down on Main Street. They are in, on an island in the Pacific and they're under attack by the Japanese and there's a foxhole. And these guys both jump into the foxhole and they look at each other and like, hey, how you doing? They both were in the same division, which is thousands of people, but they didn't know they were that close to each other. Um, and these two guys find each other in a foxhole shooting back at the Japanese, which is just absolutely, I don't know, just crazy. You can't make that stuff up and have people actually believe it. But this is one of the pictures um, that Sterling Beard lent to me that I kind of copied so I could you know, present this. This is a little, you know, I'm not even sure what to make of this. This comes out of the 1938 yearbook. So there's a candid picture of a guy or that looks like a bump stock photo and whoever was putting this together for the yearbook wrote Nazi salutes. Um, so it goes to show that the people here in town knew who the Nazis were. There's newsreels and there's radio and all that kind of stuff. Interesting, I think that it made the yearbook. So I threw it in here. So show. Okay, sports teams, 1939 soccer team. So this picture is taken in 1938. Um, the war has not started in 1938. There's been some rumblings in Europe that things are going to get bad and the Japanese have uh, conquered some places in China at this point in time. But these young guys here, um, 
don't have any idea that's going to take place. And of the folks on this team, this is a, I, I like this picture because there's lots to tell. You know, not everybody that goes into the military is handed a rifle. There are lots of different jobs. This last guy's last name is Arnold and he's a, he's a repairman uh, and for trucks. You know, he's a mechanic. You gotta have trucks running. So there he is. Um, this is Ken Krabs. This is the weirdest thing. I own his car, um, but that's a whole story for another day. Next to him is my uncle Stanley, Stanley Bowersox. Going to graduate in 1939, going to go into the paratroopers, going to jump behind enemy lines like seven times, going to be on the front line for 300 and some days, somehow doesn't get injured. This man right here, young man at this time, his name is Clarence Bachman. Clarence Bachman, again, they just look like regular guys playing soccer. Nothing about him that says, I am going to be a war hero. Uh, Clarence Bachman also will take place in the D-Day invasion as part of the 2nd Ranger Battalion. Um, he's going to win a Silver Star on the beach. He's going to get wounded on the beach. Um, again, Looking at him there, you don't pick him out of a lineup and say, that's our guy right there. That's war hero material. This man over here, his name is Robert Long. He's wounded three times during the war. And this guy, I can't remember his last name, but he's gonna drop out of school, which is not unusual at this time. During the depression, you know, people had to go help their families. They worked on farms, they did whatever. Uh, but he's gonna be captured by the, um, captured by the Germans and held prisoner for five or six months. And there's a bunch of other people in here who also served. But again, it's just this team of this guy, group of guys who had no idea what the future was going to uh, hold for them. So I just find these, these fascinating stories. All right, <clears throat> this is, I believe, no, it's not the last slide, but obviously I typed this up. These are the headlines from the Carroll County Times front page for December 12th, 1941. Pearl Harbor is December 7th, a Sunday. The Carroll County Times only published on Fridays. So everybody already knew about all this, but this is their opportunity to publish a newspaper with the big headlines, uh, stories about what's going on and Interestingly enough, and what I think is really fascinating, and I think it's a whole new, it could be a, a whole presentation of what this town and county did to help out during the war, how quickly they mobilized, how quickly they got things together. So this is December 12th, and we are already going to have a blackout rehearsal. Uh, and for those of you who aren't aware, a blackout rehearsal is kind of what it sounds like. We're going to black out the streets and all the windows and cars are gonna stop uh, because if we were to be attacked and maybe people were a little naive at this time and maybe they were just scared, but they wanted to be prepared. We don't want our town bombed or we don't want somebody flying over our town and say, okay, that's Westminster, DC's down here, Baltimore's over here, whatever. So we had blackout drills. There were local blackout drills. There were East Coast blackout drills. There were Maryland blackout drills. Um, but five days after Pearl Harbor, this town has already got its act together. And there was a series that they would ring the bell at the uh, fire company. And that was the sound. And you were to get off the streets and you were to pull over. And there were monitors, people that had certain sections of town where they walked around to make sure people were in compliance. And if you weren't, you got a knock on your door saying, hey, this is serious, you need to do something. So after this, the town just really kind of gets into a roll here and we have auxiliary policemen in case there's an emergency and we need more police because I think we only had two at the time. Uh, auxiliary firemen, just people who are trained to fight fires in case we got hit with incendiary bombs. So people volunteered to do that. We had Minutemen, just like from the you know, colonial times, people that were too old to go fight, but they wanted to feel like they were doing something. 
So they trained and they drilled and there's pictures of them at the city park training in case the war came to Carroll County that they would be willing to pick up arms and do something. So Red Cross drives, all kinds of people sewing. There's just a, an amazing amount of things that the people in this city and in the surrounding county, and I'm sure every city in the country. And I think that's what I like about the story. It's us, but it's a microcosm of every small town in America, kind of what was going on. Okay, so I have some pictures here, and these are not happy pictures. These are, these are guys who were killed in action. And there's some similarities between them. The guy on the left here is Marion Gore. Um, and this is Melvin Click on the right. They're both aviators. Marion Gore was a pilot uh, of a B-29, I think, maybe a B-17. He shot down over at Germany uh, in December of 1942, uh, 20 years old, piloting this, this ship. He played in the band, he was a trumpet player. Um, other Gores who are going to be killed also, if you see the list of names in Carroll County, there's a couple more that are going to be killed also. <clears throat> but just young, young men. Click graduated in 42, and he's killed in 44. You know, he's probably 19 years old <coughs> at the time. These two gentlemen, uh, Leister and Lydie, same graduating class. People probably set each other alphabetically. <clears throat> if they were in class together, they probably sat together all the time. Home room or behind each other and in front of each other. <clears throat> Both of them are going to get killed in action. Just, uh, I think, very compelling stories. These two gentlemen, we've already seen Hugh Spear over here on the right hand side. Uh, the person to the left is Milton Hendrickson. His the story in the paper when he is killed, he's also killed. He's killed over China on a plane in January of 1944, the write-up in the paper, it takes up the whole page just about. He must have been a remarkable young man. Both of their fathers were professors at the college. They both lived on Ridge Road. Ridge Road is not very big. Uh, I think this kind of speaks to the collective mourning uh, in the town that was taking place for the young men that were lost. And again, Westminster is a small place. It's small now. It was smaller then. There are no subdivisions then. It was the town or you lived outside on a farm. So people knew each other. Um, so Hendrickson and Spear live on the same street. There's a big age difference. Uh, he gradu Hendrickson graduated from high school in 34, Spear in 41. So they probably didn't pal around together, but they probably recognized each other. And both of them are going to be casualties of the war. And most of our guys who are casualties come in a short period of time. Most of them come after the D-Day invasion. So you're talking from June of 44 until August of 45, you're gonna condense all of this death into that one little time period. Okay, so Donald Miley is on the right. We've talked about him before. Also, I just wanna talk about why these guys are in the same picture. <clears throat> Robert Hooper to the left, class secretary for the class of 42. He lived at 121 East Main Street. He had a brother, Edward, who was a little bit older than him. They both went into the military. They both are going to get killed. They're going to get killed six days apart in um, 1944, November and early December. Their graves are in the Westminster Cemetery right next to each other. So that means their mom's gonna be a double Gold Star mother. An organization was set up, Gold Star Mothers, a support group for women who have lost uh, their kids. But unfortunately, with the dates of their death, they're gonna get this notice pretty close to Christmas, which must have been very, very sad, crushing. The reason I put Miley in this picture also, Miley worked at the city garage. Uh, the city garage building is still there. Um, 121 East Main Street is on the left-hand side. City Garage is on the right-hand side. There, you can, they're like a stone throw from each other. So that little section of town also suffered an incredible amount of loss uh, in a short, short period of time. All right. That looks like that's all I have to share. I guess I'll turn it back over to the other side.
All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve. We appreciate that. I hope everyone enjoyed it. <clears throat> so we do have time for questions. Um, to raise your hand, you can move your mouse to the bottom of the Zoom screen and a window will appear. Tap on the participant button and I'll bring up a list of participants. At the bottom of the participant list, you should see a raised hand box, although I tried it during Steve's talk and I couldn't find it. Uh, click on that and then you will see a dialog box asking you to allow us to unmute you. Click yes and your mic will be unmuted so that you can ask a question. Or you could use the chat box feature on the bottom of your Zoom screen as well. Uh, you could type in your question, which I will read out loud. Um, you could use the pull down menu to send a message to everyone or a single participant. So um, while we have people thinking about questions, uh, I have one, just a general one. Why World War II? Why did, why did that um, pique your interest in terms of researching uh, students? And um, I think because that's what I fell into. I've looked for World War I, and I can't, I'm sure there's somebody, but I can't locate anybody. This treasure trove of information just fell into my lap because I was at the high school and because there was already material there for me to just build off of. I think that's pretty much why. Okay. And I've been asked, are you going to do Korea and Vietnam and everything else? And I'm going to have to leave that to somebody else because I'm too tired. I, I, it's a lot of effort. It's a lot of effort and time to kind of do that. Steve, we have one question. I'm going to ask Trudy Leister to unmute herself to ask Steve a question, if you will, Trudy. Try to unmute her here. All right, she hopefully. Hey, Trudy. Yes, uh, this isn't a question, it's a comment. Uh, James Bowman, as you pronounced it, we pronounced it Bowman. Lived okay, down sorry the, about that. That's okay, lived down the road from us when, when I was growing up. He had three sons, married, had three sons, later uh, married a second time, but he was injured so badly, he had a metal plate in his head. Oh, see, and that's that's the beauty of doing these things because then I can find out lots of other stuff because there's there's really no way for me to find that out and that's I'm hoping by doing this that I can get other information and build on the story. So I really appreciate you telling me that. That's that's I don't want to say it's nice, but it's nice that you shared that. Well, I, he didn't seem to have any problems with it. He right. uh, worked, he worked as a carpenter and built homes and did remodeling and my brother-in-law worked with him for a while and oh, interesting. Was, all right thank you very much he and my father would go fishing and hunting together so and we were just a neighbor's friend you know friend, friends of the, fa of the fa two families yeah and i think it's interesting that someone who kind of goes through what he went through then can come back and adjust to just a, well let's call it a normal life and just fit into society i always find that Pretty amazing also. Thank you. Thank you. Pretty. So we have a couple of uh, comments. Uh, one um, from Doris Hull, excellent presentation, Steve. The personal stories are very touching. And then for from Kristen. Thank you, Doris. Um, she says, just as uh, good as Ken Burn. And uh, anything about the German POW farm workers, anything about local Germans or Italians that you've uncovered? I am. Um, I really, I've seen going through the old Carroll County Times, which again, if you haven't, if you haven't gone through that, the archives of the Carroll County Times are amazing for the war years. And they do talk about the POWs and that there was a procedure, you could go higher. We had a, a severe shortage of uh, farm laborers because guys were out going into war um, and they brought Nazis over here which I'm guessing probably was the best gig they could get. You know, come to America as a farm worker is probably better than most of their other options. And I, I've heard that people did hire them, but I, I personally do not know too much about it. And about local Germans or Italians, uh, I mean, my uncle Bauer Sox is pretty German, so I don't, I, I don't know of any stories where people were harassed, um, if that's what you're asking, because I'm not sure. 
Um, but then again, I don't know. We have another question from Mimi. Mimi, uh, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Mimi. Okay. Um, there's a fellow named Charles Havens, uh, who's also buried at, at Westminster Cemetery, way in the back. Mm -hmm. And uh, we wrote him up a little bit in this book we have of, of people um, who are buried in the cemetery. And let me read you something about Charles Havens. He taught at, at Westminster High School. He also was a coach at, at Western Maryland. At Western Maryland. He's a football coach. Absolutely. So um, here is what it said in uh, 1996 when he died. After World War II began, Mr. Havens joined the Army Air Corps in 42. Too old to fly, he became an intelligence officer with the 486 Bomber Group in Sudbury, England. Each day he parked his Jeep at the end of the runway and watched the planes taking off for bombing raids over Germany. Every time we took off, my nose gunner would say, there's the coach, um, a retired Air Force colonel said in a 1986 article in the Baltimore Sun. It almost <laughs> became a good luck symbol to see him as the last man on the ground as we left, and yes, the first one we saw as we got back. On the morning of May 20th, 1944, two B-24 bombers collided in heavy fog, ignoring the danger from 500 pound bombs and 2,000 gallons of gasoline, Mr. Havens pulled 22 men from the wreckage, 12 of them survived. Wow. And he received the Soldier's Medal the highest award for a non-military, for non-military bravery. Pretty, pretty cool. That's very cool. There's yes. a, if, if you go through the, Car again, I'm going to keep saying this, if you go through the Carroll County Times archives, there's a pretty big story when he goes off to war because he was very well known around town. Exactly. And from the college, and I think he may have coached at Harvard <clears throat> before he came down here, but I could be making that up. But thank you. That's, that's a great story. Thanks. Do you have any more questions? So um, you've been doing this since uh, 2007. Have you uh, been in contact with any, uh, some um, World War II veterans that you found through your research? I was early on. Early on. Unfortunately, hmm. most of them have passed. Uh, okay. But there, so on March 12th, uh, we had a get together at the high school and three of the guys showed up. One of them, it was his 95th birthday. I mean, they're all in the class of like 42. So you figure they're born in like 1924. They're getting up there in age, but they were doing really well. Sterling Carr, who still lives here in town, was there. Um, one of the, I think Melvin Hurwitz was there. Um, but they were good. They loved it. They, I mean, they loved the attention. They loved people talking to them and, and reminiscing and seeing each other and so we have had a couple sit downs, got some personal information, but I will say most of the information that I've garnered that I've used on this has come from those other sources that, that I've uh, mentioned. All right, let's see if we have any more questions. So um, I'm, I'm just curious, any of your students feel like they want to sort of pick up where you sort of left off? Is there, is there any interest or what do you think? There might be, it's really difficult. I teach mostly kids who are in 10th grade. That's where US history is. Yeah. And 10th grade is that you're 15 years old and your, your perspective eight years ago, you were in elementary school and that seems like a long time ago. Yeah. So it's really, I think it's hard for them to understand all of this and how it plays out. And those people are really old and they could not ever have been young. Yeah. So it, it takes a little while. So I haven't, I did have some people help me do some research. And I, at the end of the year, I make the kids research a month during the war so they can see what was going on. Yeah. But I, I just think it's the wrong time in their lives to really kind of capture them where it's gonna really make a big impact. Hopefully, you planted seeds so that you know. I, that's what I, 
years down the road, they'll be That's interested. what you got to hope for. Hopefully it'll come back at some point in time and it's like, oh man, we learned something about this and then they go forward with it. That's what you got to hope for. Yeah. All right. Uh, I guess there are no more questions. So thank you so much, Steve, for sharing this with us. It was really fascinating, really interesting. And all the Thanks local stories everything. are just great. And yeah, I've got uh, more. If you need me to come back. I know. We should have you back next year. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thanks again, and thanks for thanks everyone for joining us. A rebroadcast of this presentation will be available on CMC's YouTube page, uh, as well as well as on our uh, website. So if you go to our website, you go to Discover and then Video. Uh, these um, uh, all of our uh, box lunch talks and talks to the tavern will be embedded there uh, eventually, and I think we have most of them up now. Um, as you know. Uh, we typically charge an entrance fee of $3 for members and $7 for non-members. If you enjoyed the presentation tonight, please go to hsecmd.org. And on the top right-hand side of the, uh, the homepage, you'll see a donate button and you can hit that. And uh, small gifts add up to make a big difference. And uh, before we go, I'd like to, to announce a few upcoming historical society events, if you'll bear with me. Uh, I'm happy to say that our Saturday uh, tour of Westminster Cemetery on October 3rd at 2 p.m. has been sold out. So um, uh, this is a tour of the cemetery by uh, Mimi Ashcraft, and it's going to be a great event, and, and maybe we can talk her into doing it again next spring or next summer, uh, but I'm happy to see that it's been sold out. Uh, on October um, 20th, uh, Tuesday at noon, uh, to get us in the mood for Halloween, Professor of Comparative Literature at Nikkei University in Japan, Dr. Jesse Glass will be joining us. He's going to be zooming in from Japan. Who knows what time it will be there, but uh, I think it's going to be a great presentation. So he'll share some ghost tales and folklore about Carroll County. His book, Ghosts and Legends, originally published in 1982, updated in 1998, is scheduled for a new edition uh, in 2020. And Dr. Glass is very impressive and should be a great talk. Uh, on uh, Thursday, October 22nd, uh, it'll be our last um, talk of the tavern from 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, this talk will be a fascinating and spooky treat by Frank Badovic. We'll be talking about the 1938 radio dramatization of H.G. Wells's War of the Worlds. So the broadcast frightened millions, triggered an FCC ruling, and became a case study in the power of the media. And Frank, I'll play some excerpts from the historic radio broadcast and discuss its continuing power and appeal. And lastly, just to make sure everyone knows who's watching on TV or Facebook, uh, uh, our Breaking Barriers exhibit is open, uh, focusing on women's suffrage and the temperance movement. Uh, please call uh, to make an appointment to uh, come and visit and learn about the local women in these two movements. Uh, so I hope everyone is staying safe and best wishes for continued good health. Thanks for joining us and have a great evening. And thanks again to Steve. Uh, we appreciate it. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks.